madam to give a couple of initial uh, remarks and then uh, we will uh, start with your uh, Should I come there? <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, uh, Dr. Guru Prasad, um, Mr. Dr. Murli Krishna and Dr. Maruti, and uh, all the people who have uh, logged in. Thank you very much uh, for uh, agreeing for, to talk to us and our students on this very important topic. We are very happy that uh, this is one of the first uh, few institutions, medical institutions in the country mm -hmm. to have an institutional innovation council. And uh, we uh, hope that uh, these lectures uh, given by uh, experts such as you would be harnessed uh, in good earnest by our students and faculty. And we hope to uh, come up with some good innovations with uh, all kinds of uh, collaborations. Um, we also would like to uh, mention that uh, we are very proud that Ramaya Evolute has also been established with uh, Dr. Murli Krishna as the CEO. And just last week, uh, it has uh, this Ramaya Evolute has instituted uh, awards to many startups, uh, cash awards. Uh, so that uh, that is one way of encouraging innovation. So uh, this is one of the initiatives of uh, uh, a private medical institution and we're very happy and proud to be a part of this. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for uh, agreeing to speak to us and uh, we welcome you to go ahead, Dr. Guru Prasad. Thank you, sir. Uh, before we actually start uh, hearing from Guru Prasad, sir, uh, uh, two minutes uh, overview of what the Institutional Innovation Council and what are the activities, because for some of the students as well as faculty, they might not be uh, fully aware of the program. So very briefly, Soumya will uh, share the objects of the IIC and uh, uh, from Guru Prasad, sir, after that, so that we can manage it. Sure. Soumya, who is the coordinator of the Innovation Council and we will briefly speak on what the Innovation Council is all about. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, ma'am, for the uh, lovely introduction to the Institution Innovation Council. Um, so this is something really unique about our uh, medical college because all of you must be wondering, okay, so we do an MBBS, then we do an MBA and MS. How do we think about, about startup? But if you look at uh, you know the various schemes and the various hackathons, uh, you know online and under the AGs of the department, the main one of the most important things is healthcare and biomedical devices. So healthcare and biomedical devices are a hot topic in terms of you know innovation. And who better than us than you as students, you know, to be a part of this uh, this amazing um, new thing that's happening, right? So, um, as for the AICT, the main aims of, of an institution's innovation fund is to create a vibrant local innovation which is what we are trying to do for all of you. Uh, to have a startup supporting mechanism in higher education institutions, to prepare the institute for the area or other ranking of institutions and innovation and to establish, uh, you know, council like ecosystems for how to migrate and be incubation ideas. And you know, the wonderful thing about Rama Medical College is that we have connections and collaborations with various other, um, you know, people and institutions and and uh, um, other people who would help us in many ways in you know taking our ideas forward. So, like I said, uh, we need to encourage innovations, entrepreneurship, and startups. And uh, you know, to help you help yourself, we are you know preparing ourselves and equipping ourselves as well. We've undergone an innovation ambassador training, and we would like you to equip equip yourselves as well. And in lieu of this, we have the national innovation and startup policy, which we have also imbibed into our system. And one thing that all of us have to be proud of is we are one of the few medical colleges that has taken up this thing. So some of the things that you know are in the offing, so to say, under the government are the P 2.0. Uh, 
so these are this is a great opportunity to you know uh, look for seed funding for your innovation so if you have any ideas this is something that you need to look into and you know these uh, yukti uh, yukti 2.0 is open round the year and you know you have um, evaluations happening in may and june and in november december you have shortlisting happening in june july and december january and of course you connect with your incubators mentors in july august and jan feb respectively the next thing is the kapila or the kalam program for it literacy and awareness so this is important because if we you know as staff and students have any idea that is patentable the uh, kapila is ready to give us help in terms of you know um, helping us patent our ideas and of course there's something that you might have seen on the papers as well your smart india hackathon which is coming soon so when we interact with some of our students we uh, get to hear that a lot of our students are very much into coding as well so this is an amazing combination to be able to code and to be able to you know um, uh, look into the healthcare aspect because when these two come together we we it's a hotbed for innovation and um, again to reiterate my point healthcare and biomedical biomedical devices are a very very important aspect of the smart india hackathon as well and so like i said there are many such things that keep coming on so our job here is to introduce you to all these things so there was this asian asian india hackathon 2021 that was a joint hackathon between india and the asian countries then of course we have the national innovation contest as well which again um, the one of the main themes is your healthcare and biomedical devices so i know we've just made a small step you know into the journey of innovation but the journey for 1000 miles begins with the same thank you so much this is the introduction so if any of you uh, from the uh, staff as well as the students have any query we're always here to help you out um next um, uh, uh, something that you all must be, must have been waiting for we have dr guru prasad with us he is a vice president as bosch at bosch and he has uh, you know many uh, innovations and patents to his name and he is uh, the recipient of the you know very important and very famous cs innovation awards the epda awards and he also won recently the nascom engineering and innovation award so we have a very important person in our midst who is going to tell us about how uh, innovation and medicine can come together so thank you for joining us sir the master now do you think i should start yes sir yes sir okay i will try to share my screen there are also quite a number of colleagues from uh, my team who are also on the call so they have also been part of all these things and they are also very keen to hear the program so they have joined from bosch as well are you able to see my slide deck yes sir we can perfect so what i will do is i will uh, little bit run through this and uh, maybe uh, i think i will i will take about 20 minutes what what we have uh, as a team thought is that we will we will uh take through the journey of innovation and medicine with the following three key agenda, four, four agenda points what are the key drivers what possible use cases are there globally we want to demonstrate one use case which has been evolved here which also has some sort of uh, ongoing connection with ramaya where some of the topics are going on and then finally uh, what is the bigger conclusion we want to derive out of it with that i start uh competition and convergence these are the things which are driving breakthrough innovations i i pick up a phrase this is from the latest uh, mckinsey report this is the mckinsey report talks about the top technology trends and coincidentally this time they also talk about healthcare yeah so i'll just read out for the sake of importance in the next 10 years we will experience more progress than the past 100 years combined as technology reshapes health and material sciences and a wide range of industries and domain 
Unifying and underlying all technology trends is a combinational effect of a massively fast computation, propelling new convergences between technologies, startling breakthroughs in health and material sciences, astonishing new product and service functionalities, and an irresistible foundation for reinventions. This I thought should set the context of what we will see or what we are already seeing and some of the things which we are going to see which will impact the world of medicine and healthcare. The same paper goes on to list some technology trends which I, I have just extracted for the pharmaceutical and healthcare domain because I think you're more interested about to hear about this healthcare as a sector which consists of pharma and healthcare. And if you really see, for example, applied artificial intelligence is supposed to have a major influence in both pharmaceutical and health. And I'm sure the COVID situation, I, 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 we are pretty clear now what was the impact, what this one area created in the vaccine development in various things which we have tried out. Other topics, for example, uh, connectivity. Connectivity will play a significantly important role, important role in terms of the 5G technologies, which is going to revolutionize how things are going to be perceived on two sides of the, the, the connectivity. And then the whole topic of the Internet of Things and how medical devices will come alive with some sort of their connectivity and start talking to each other and talking to the world. Like that, if you see on the left side, there are several of the technology trends. And it's interesting to see that very many of them either have a major influence or a significant influence in the healthcare sector. This again is the McKinsey report. Uh, if you really look at some of the topics, the computation and connectivity somewhere is something which you can extract. And ultimately, if you have computation and connectivity, that is the hotbed for building intelligence onto such systems. Now, from the world of medicine, the intelligence is always profoundly available, but we always associate intelligence in the world of medicine and healthcare to the experts and the knowledge they have hidden inside their brain, which we call as the intelligence. But as there is an explosion of the human population, there is no way these experts can really multiply and become so many more to cater to this growing population. And inevitably, technology and machines will have to come together to provide at least some sort of those intelligence which are today hidden within an expert mind, which are programmable, which are buildable into a machine which can mimic the human expert's mind. With this as a context, now you may be wondering, this is, okay, the, the previous two slides are very nice, very theoretical, very nice to read, but what is the real use case which I can relate to or you all can relate to? There we thought that it is better that this time we pick up a use case which is done out of India, leveraging very many of these technologies and to a topic so deep in medicine that you will immediately be able to appreciate this makes sense. I move on to slide number four. This is a global problem. I'm sure as uh, practicing uh, 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 clinicians, you know that 1.6 billion people on this earth suffer from a condition called anemia. Anemia burden reduction is part of the World Health Organization global targets for 2025. It is that profound and that big a problem. Because I'm talking to clinicians, I don't have to tell what is anemia. I think anemia is very clearly this decreased oxygen carrying capability. And somewhere effects of anemia, poor immunity, fetal development, fatigue, lethargy, and finally, um, various other uh, impairment and functional impairment as well, including cardiac functions, etc. On the right side, you see the global prevalence very clearly. This is more the southern hemisphere countries which suffer because predominantly this condition, at least a large amount of that, comes from nutritional aspects which are easily solvable because this is not a disease, but it requires it to be detected in the first place. This is the problem. 
And because you're clinicians, we purposely put this slide because you will be wondering, oh, this is a known topic. We have been dealing with this for a long time. The way it is dealt with the conventional methods, I'm sure you'll be able to relate to. There are the laboratory-based solutions, the typical cell counter, or for example, the Salis method, where there is a venous blood which is drawn, and then the machine does the work and tells the hemoglobin content. There are also a vast number of people who require a point of care approach, and there we have a fingerprint, a figure, fingerprint blood uh, droplet, which goes into either a spectroscopy-based device, I think that is a HemoQ device, which you see the red one, or the real rudimentary World Health Organization color scale, where you just compare on a reagent strip the color. What are the challenges with this? Typically, it starts with infection risk, in case of cell counters, investments, availability, training, wait times. Again, when it comes to the point of care, consumable, and finally, the whole aspect of accuracy. This is the picture of the current situation, which we are used to, and as clinicians, which you will be dealing with it regularly. Now, what is that? This area requires for it to be transformed. One of the first thing, the, 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 the needs are that, can I have a solution which is non-invasive? I don't want to draw blood, nor prick somebody's finger or hand. It should be precise enough so that I'm able to use it. Can it be connected so that I do, really don't care where the machine is used, I'm able to get the information. I really want a fast throughput because hemoglobin checking, I would rather want it really fast. And finally, can I have a device which is portable and handheld because this problem largely is a place where the human being walking into the clinical facility is not the case here mostly the human being is even unaware that they need a test to be conducted for a particular condition called anemia they're suffering that. So you have the acid situation on the left side, you have possibly a to be or a dream situation on the right side. This is the story where we began our journey with. I move on to slide number six. Slide number six is the solution which has been evolved simplified rapid anemia screening at the doorstep. Important thing, it's non-invasive, it's affordable, and it can be deployed in mass population setups. You may wonder that, okay, this looks very nice on the this one. So that was the reason we were a little bit struggling with the video. Can you see the devices? If you, for a minute, switch on towards the video where I'm being projected. So you see the same device, the two variants which you see on the screen, I'm holding by hand. I'm sure you'll be able to appreciate that's exactly the photo which you see on the screen there. The one on my right hand is the advanced version which has its own, the Viva Ray HB Pro, which has its own display. You can even see the display with the values, et cetera. And the one on the, my left hand is a basic version which will give a, 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 a bucketed, uh, normal, mild, moderate, severe classification of anemia. And it is as portable as this. And it is this handy to carry around. Yeah. What is this? You can see on the right side, a single button operation. There is a finger slot into which a human finger can go. And without pricking or breaching the human skin barrier, the device optically measures the circulating hemoglobin. What are the use cases? I'm sure I don't have to tell this, but anemia screening health camps, clinical trials, clinical setup, for example, in maternity, imagine a gynecologist who can have this on her table top. Every time a pregnant lady comes, within 30 seconds, she'll be able to know the hemoglobin value. And finally, because it's so portable and convenient, it can be taken for home testing by private clinics and help in home care as well. This solution, yeah, now uh, you can see it. As you can imagine, it has all the mechanical elements. It has an integrated single board computer. Please note that the compute, co compute power is within this device. It even has its own battery pack. So you can, as you can see, I have no wired connection. The device can operate. 
And finally, at the fundamental level, you may say, what is the science about? It is based on the Beer Lambert's law. There are light emitting diodes. You can see the middle picture at the bottom. You insert a, uh, your finger and then certain specific wavelengths of light is passed through the nail bed. And then there's a phototransmitter at the bottom, which absorbs the, the, the uh, transmitted light. And then the right side, the whole PPG signal and the extraction of the hemoglobin component from the PPG signal. The solution, uh, now I, I request you to a little bit reflect upon some of the technologies in the first two slides. In slide number seven, you see very many of them, including the intelligence on the board. The algorithm which actually measures and detects the hemoglobin is within this device. This device does not require even an internet and hence it's actually self-sufficient. The device also comes connected on demand. You can see the devices in the middle and then it can be connected to a backbone, internet of medical things, connectivity platform, we call that as VivaSuit. It starts from device registration to distributor management to actually because there are algorithms, you can even do a remote flashing over the air and then keep the devices up to date. On the right side, you see the device comes also paired with a mobile phone. The mobile phone can be used as an extension to this device for secure communication, user management. You can configure the device. You can manage various service requests. And finally, it acts as a gateway for the information in the device to be taken into a cloud system. Please note that the, the device and the mobile phone are wirelessly connected via a Bluetooth low energy pairing. And that should keep the device intact. If somebody does not want the mobile phone, the values come on the device. If somebody wants connectivity, they pair it to a mobile phone. It's a simple app. And you all know that by a simple app, you can take the information back into the central system. Now, being clinicians, you say, OK, this guy comes from an engineering world. My, several of my colleagues are also engineers who are on the call. These things are all great. But what is the proof in the pudding? So we believe that this has to stand the scrutiny of the clinical world. And we have invested significant amount of energies. Each one of these devices has about 25 patents, which have been filed from this organization in India, which are worldwide relevant. And hence, it has a high innovative component. And then the actual, we are doing the actual clinical trials now. And the results of that have already been published in two international journals of repute, the Journal of Biomedical and Health Informatics during 2020, and the most recent IEEE Sensors Journal, we have a publication. Anybody interested, please note that this is available independent of Bosch. And please go through it. Each one of the documents, uh, each one of the paper is very well written. Our collaboration and licensing partner for some of the underlying technology was Johns Hopkins. So they too figure in the paper and hence it has stood enormous scrutiny to come to this stage. I have even shared the link. You can even Google it and you will get it. I request you to kindly download and read it and then you'll be able to visualize the depth of technology implementation and what has been achieved in this innovative device. I'll move on. Uh, the case, uh, just to recap, we had the technology trends, looked very theoretical, but very interesting. We then had the real case study. I'm sure you're a little bit more convinced. Maybe this is working. I can assure you that this is really technology which has been implemented into an innovative intelligent medical device. And then we come to the next section because you're all from the clinical world. Uh, how does this type of innovation percolate into the healthcare world. Medical fraternity, my view, is a crucial pillar in enabling technology adoption. And I thought that I should share some thoughts in terms of how you can be the hotbed of not only the innovation, also the adoption, which ultimately will take this whole storyline to a needy patient, enabling in a better care. First point creating a shared purpose of care. Yeah? Technology aids are making problem identification and evidence-based decision-making a reality. This should create a shared purpose for delivering care with lower risk. 
because one of the challenges for a clinician is they're always in the investigative mode to gather as much information as possible from the patient in order to triage what is the actual problem. Now, why don't we use this technology to enable in this identification faster and the evidence-based decision-making much more practical? The second point, a digital front door for omnipresent care. Some of these terms are from my side. Pardon me if it sounds very crazy. Technology layer has a potential to scale beyond the physical facility boundaries and strengthen the patient and clinician interaction at their mutually convenient time. Today, when we talk of care, the care is always somehow visualized within a large building, which we call a hospital or a clinic or a laboratory. And somehow we feel that the transaction begins and ends in that building. The future of medicine the transaction may not happen like that because we will never be able to build these many buildings, these many structures in order to cater to the growing population. You need the technology to extend this building into the homes of patient and then automatically the patient expects they, are, they would like to be in touch with you because ultimately there are things which they would want to discuss with you and they cannot wait anymore to come to the central facility. Third point, a collaborative approach for holistic care, breaking down specialization silos and collaboration in real time for seamless diffusion of updated knowledge base, aiding in patient treatment. The, the, the world of medicine is becoming so super specialized. All the specialists are keenly looking forward for a collaboration amongst themselves. Technology can actually be a great collaborating and enabling agent because all the experts are so busy running around and caring for their patients, which is only going to ever increase. Finally, an efficient approach to targeted care, leveraging technology to focus on individual patient needs and personalizing care plans, thereby strengthening patient and caregiver relationship. Today, we have a broad-based approach. Like there was a, uh, 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 somebody quoted in a forum a patient even with a mild fever would want to consult the most senior expert with about five super specialized degree because they psychologically feel they want to be heard by the best person. But in reality, it's never going to be possible. And we need to have personalized care and we need to be able to invest resources based on the specific condition only. These are some points which I thought I, 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 I place it in front of you because very many of you are the future of medicine, you have a very important role to play that you are able to effectively care for the patient, but at the same time, you are also not just feeling burdened and completely drained out because the patient population, the patient expectation is only going to increase and increase. It is not going to decrease. Two sentences from my side on this topic. And then you say, okay, this is all fine, but can we make it happen? I'm sure all of you will be thinking, oh, this is an engineer and coming and lecturing us on how to care for patients. We are very well trained upon it, but we somehow don't think so this is possible. At this point, I leave you with only this message. This was my conversation with Dr. Devi Prasad Shetty, you know, from Narayana Health. He himself is a cardiac surgeon, so he comes from you as a fraternity entrepreneur, chairman, and he was also the founder. And during one of my conversation, we had this, I captured it. I have also shared this slide to Dr. Shetty and he is very happy that we're discussing this. Facebook, the first one, the world's most popular media owner, they do not create any content. When they started, it was unbelievable. They made all of us the content creator, but they became a $1 trillion valued company. Second one, you say, okay, that's digital media. Easy, somebody is taking photographs, somebody is taking a video, and hence it was possible. Second one comes, again, one other Bay Area company called Uber. Today is the world's largest taxi company, but they don't own a single car or a taxi. This now defies the purpose even further. The first one was digital media. The second one is a tangible, movable, moving asset. Coming from Bosch, I can tell you the... <laughs> the amount of passion we have for cars and vehicles. 
and this company here comes they say we will not own any vehicle but we will be the world's largest taxi company you may say okay this is a car a vehicle okay this is fine and hence i purposely come closer to the your world airbnb this is the accommodation provider when all the people were wondering about which hotel to build which guest house to build how to equip it here comes one company again and says i want to be the largest accommodation provider but i shall not own any real estate so facebook world's most popular media owner creating no content uber the largest taxi company having no vehicles airbnb the largest accommodation provider who having no real estate and then i leave you with a profound message one day there will be a world's largest healthcare provider they may not have any beds just like the previous three it looks distant but inevitably we are heading in this way and you will all be at the forefront of this technology revolution and that technology revolution will have a positive impact on the world of healthcare not that people are not creating photos or videos not that none of us travel by taxi not that we don't take accommodation in hotels and this one but the whole thing will have a paradigm shift in terms of how technology will make it happen and who will be the biggest player leaving the rest of them aside at this point i pause i do hope that i have been able to bring across uh, dr nand kumar and uh, dr soumya had given me some premises what technology one concrete use case some messages for clinicians who are going to be the future of healthcare for at least half a century ahead because you will all practice and last one what is that why they should look at this and not think it as one more lecture i do hope that i have met your expectation i will pause here in the event you have any questions thank you thanks a lot sir a uh, very uh, precise and at the same time uh, impactful way of uh, uh, showcasing the used cases because in in in, in the healthcare we often as as uh, students of science uh, we we are uh, uh, merging research and innovations under the same heading many a times like uh, when 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 we talk about research they say that oh it should be unique and it should be innovative but the world is moving beyond research and what we are seeing is innovations in its best form with a translational potential for action and uh, in primary healthcare we use this term appropriate technology which means that like the technology should not be very uh, sort of like prohibitive for both in terms of cost and usability for the end user we might have the best of ai and ml algorithms in the back end but the person in the remotest rural area be it be the provider or the user should not be confounded by that uh, immense technology in the this thing so we have lab on a chip and as you have rightly mentioned the mckinsey report the eny projections are in the domain of digital convergence for and in healthcare so that that's an uh, excellent uh, way and uh, for the audience who are listening like uh, we have been fortunate enough to sort of like join hands with uh, bosch with the guru prasad sir's team uh, in 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 sort of like giving the clinical and the statistical uh, support for validating some of the things that uh, is being done uh, very innovatively through the bosch uh, uh, healthcare division and we certainly uh, uh, look forward for this engagement to move further so that we can bring the affordable and appropriate technology to the masses in in, in the truest sense of uh, uh something for everyone to their needs using technology convergence so thanks a lot for that sir and uh, certainly we will be engaging with your team and uh, these kinds of mutual interactions uh, hopefully will uh, lead to something where we can say hospitals and uh, the entire health infrastructure without any physical infrastructure so we will we'll move towards that thanks a lot for your uh, kind words thank you thank you bye 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 sir bye thank you sir uh it was a wonderful talk thank you so much for being with us and i think dr nandakumar has uh, said what everything that i also want to say 
So I will not waste the time on the forum, sir. Thanks a lot. I hope to meet you more often and uh, engage with you more often. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. So, like we were discussing, uh, Ramya Medical College is one of the few colleges which has taken up the um, IIC initiative. So, in connection with this, Ramya Group of in Institutions has also uh, started off uh, the startup uh, ecosystem called Evolute. Right. So, this is something that's really unique for us because we have everything under one uh, in one campus. We have uh, the Ramya Evolute. Which also, uh, uh, which is under the umbrella of the Ramaya Group, which also houses one of the largest hospitals in the country. So, in this regard, we have uh, two uh, very interesting people who will be joining us today, Mr. Samartha and uh, Mr. Mudri Krishnan. Uh, both me and Dr. Nadakumar had the opportunity to, you know, attend this program where um, they um, showed us how they were engaging with startups, how they were mentoring startups. So in this regard, it will be a very interesting uh, discussion with them to see how we as healthcare professionals and as students uh, can engage with them uh, to come up with innovations. Mr. Murli Krishnan and Mr. Samartha. Thank you, Dr. Swamya. <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, I will uh, probably just go into my presentation straight away. Uh, is it uh, visible? I hope the presentation is visible for to you. Yeah, it's visible and loud and clear. Okay. Uh, so I think let me uh, spend a few minutes, uh, you know, up front. Uh, talking about what is Ramaya Evolute. Uh, at a very micro level, it's a Section 8 company started by the uh, Ramaya Group, by the Gokula Trust. And its intent is to function as a super accelerated VC or a super accelerated, accelerated venture fund. Now, uh, why these terms? Uh, most of you are, I'm sure, familiar with venture funds. Venture funds invest in uh, startups uh, of certain maturity and take them to the next level. Typically, a uh, venture fund looks at investing in the uh, investment region of about five years to seven years. That basically means that they, if they invest some money, they would expect to get returns in five to seven years. An accelerated uh, VC invests in startups with a three to five year time frame. We are a super accelerated venture fund, and we expect between 18 to 24 months for our investments to come through. So is our objective just to invest money? Uh, not really. Actually, the idea uh, was this. Uh, so we looked at these purpose triangle for Ramaya Evolute. So there are three separate stakeholders for a you know, a institution like Ramaya Evolute. There are the Ramaya group of educational institutions. There are the upcoming entrepreneurs and students who want to become entrepreneurs. Then, of course, there are markets uh, and the funding agencies like seed and, seed and angel in investors, corporates, etc. Uh, Ramaya group of institutions have a uh, what is their stake in this? Uh, one is that uh, this could potentially give them uh, an impact on the branding because if there's a successful startup out of Ramaya Evolute, it can have a positive rub off on the ranking, on the branding. Uh, it could improve uh, their uh, ranking in terms of the NIRF uh, rankings and things like that. Uh, the objective of the uh, company, Ramaya Evolute, is to provide a growth in value of the investment with a CAGR of about 30%. That basically means an year-on-year -year growth of about 30%. And we are supposed to be sustainable in three years and reach break even in five years. Uh, similarly, for students, uh, survival is a major issue when you start a company, uh, how to survive and you know, uh, uh, how do you take a company from where it is when it started to a reasonably successful company which can stand on its own. Uh, you need guidance, you need mentoring, 
you need set, you know ability to set a vision and uh, ability to work towards a vision and all those things uh, then you need all the you know physical things you know you need low cost high quality infrastructure because the money is uh, in short supply and you need a guarantee for success i mean absolutely in life there is there are no guarantees but a much higher possibility of success i'll come to that point a bit later similarly for market what do they need investors are looking at investing good quality companies investors are looking at uh, companies which have got proven due diligence some professional uh, institutions have really helped them grow so that uh, their credentials are valuable and there is there needs to be a certain proof of success so this is the overall ramaya evaluate purpose triangle and when we looked at this we just, you know uh, the question was what do you invest in you know what kind of startups do we select and who do we invest in uh we went by two uh basic principles one is that uh, the ramaya group of institutions and especially the msr campus that we have uh, has about 11 large uh, high education institutions which basically means there is a lot of high technology being developed in multiple disciplines within the same campus and one of the biggest problems in the startup ecosystem is that it's very difficult to make a cross disciplinary startup uh, a startup which you know combines medical and electronic uh, technologies uh, you just listen to uh, mr edgar prasad's speech and uh, and in, you know for a company like bosch which you know with all its funding and all that it is so difficult to come out with a successful product and you know prove it in the uh, market and take it Uh, adopt it get it adopted by uh, customers uh, just think of a normal startup with no funding with that a student is starting or a, you know entrepreneur is starting it's very very difficult so a single discipline startups like you know pure software startups are much easier but if you have a cross disciplinary product it's very very difficult so i think we decided to focus on cross disciplinary because that is where failures were much higher and we thought we could come out with value in that second was uh, the uh, you know in the rate of failures of startups i mean you know that uh, startups 97% of the startups fail or 95% of the startups fail I mean, and there are different different statistics but it's definitely more than 90% and that's not a good situation I mean, you know uh, when you start something if you have a possibility of 90% failure why would you even start right so that's a really bad situation and how can we improve it was our thought uh and one example that we have is uh, you know india in terms of uh, its uh, infant mortality and its uh, age uh, expected life you know life life expectancy of indians when we uh, became independent country in 1947 i think our life expect- expectancy was in low 30s it was 32 or 33 and uh, you know 70 years later it's somewhere close to 70 now Uh, which basically means that we have increased our life expectancy you know by more than 100% probably 130 and 40% uh and how did we do it a significant part of this was by reducing infant mortality so we uh, you know invested in our uh, infant care programs we uh, invested in uh, vaccinations and infant care and uh, delivery care and that's really how we moved a significant part of it i mean of course there were developing in other places as well but the significant movement from 32 or 33 to 70 is a contribution of the uh, impact that we have had on the infant mortality and we thought that is where we should concentrate as well because that's where companies fail also they they fail very early because uh, you know if they are not able to get to a level where they can gather funding in the first year or two uh then it becomes very very difficult for them to continue because there is nobody to support so there are these are two principles that we looked at we will look at early startups and we will look at cross disciplinary startups to invest in and this is the purpose of the uh company it to become the first cross disciplinary startup ecosystem in india uh giving a complete holistic platform uh which includes funding uh, facilities uh, both smart and uh, you know basic facilities uh, uh, mentoring uh, visioning deal making and provide an incubation of 18 months to 24 months and take them to the next level at the same time by doing this 
provide a 30% growth to our investors, which is the, the Ramaya Group. So this is the purpose statement of the company. Uh, who are we? I mean, we are the uh, what two of us who started this with uh, uh, with uh, the MSRIT and the Ramaya Evolute uh, board is Samartha is a, uh, he has been a CEO in four public companies in the last 14 years. He's been working, you know, he is a CEO of Kyocera Group in India, Mindtree, Video, Video Con Group, and Fibers. He has done three successful startups. Uh, he has had three exits, and he's current partner in a venture fund. So he has had multiple technology uh, experiences, including multiple startup experiences, uh, which include uh, setting up, growing, and exiting. Uh, that is, uh, some, he has got a extremely good uh, ex uh, experience to do something like this. He is our chief strategist, and uh, I am Murli Krishnan. Uh, I've been the CEO of uh, Saskin, and uh, I've been driving uh, the communication business at uh, Tata Alexi. Uh, I've had uh, multiple ways of uh, chances of uh, investing in uh, uh, startups. I'm actually an active mentor and investor in the startup ecosystem in uh, Bangalore, mostly in the last 10 years. Uh, I also did the large product development activity that Saskin did, uh, which uh, had our uh, software IP going into phones all over the world. I mean, we have probably about a billion phones uh, in the world carrying the IP from Saskin. So, and uh, it made good IP sales and good revenues for Saskin. So that's my background. So this is the overall structure. Uh, so the nothing much to, yeah, I think you can view this. Uh, we have the board, which consists of the uh, chairman, vice chairman, the chief strategist, then the CEO and uh, chief mentors. Then uh, we have the mentors who will work with each startup. And we have the in, you know enterprises that are uh, supporting the, uh, are, which are undergoing the incubation. Uh, how does this flow happen? Uh, I think the first thing that we did actually, if you see, uh, we are probably at this, uh, uh, at the entry point of this, in the sense that we, in the last four or five months, I mean, uh, the, the soft launch of my Evolute happened in March, and in the five months going from there, about two to three months, we were doing uh, active digital campaigning. We invited applications for startups, and uh, starting from May, middle of May till end of June, applications were open. We had about 150, 160 applications which came in. Uh, we had uh, a very, very thorough process of evaluation of these uh, applications. And then uh, uh, we had, in fact, uh, we honored the top 24 startups uh, yesterday with, uh, uh, not yesterday, the day before yesterday, with an award, in an award function as a Start Startups of India. So once we get the startups in, we have a seat, you know, we put, put in the seat team, we put in the infrastructure, and we put in the mentoring. We take them through the next two, you know, 18 months to two years to a level where they can be successful. Uh, what does success mean in the case of a startup? Success basically means that uh, you go to the next level. So basically, uh, you get to the next level of investment. It could be from a VC, it could be from a corporate, it could be that the corporate buys you out, but at least in the level that, you know, you've passed the infant mortality stage. We have gone into a level where you can stand on your own. So that's what we intend to do with the process of uh, uh, Ramaya Evolute mentoring. Uh, we have an exceedingly select, you know, stringent criteria for selection. Uh, uh, you may uh, see the, you know, award function that we did uh, yesterday and you you might want to see the start, kind of startups that were there uh, extremely you know innovative extremely uh, high technology and uh, high potential startups that we had uh, and our uh, uh, next year year and a half challenge will be to mentor these startups and take them to take them to the next level uh, what do we do i mean you know in what areas do we uh, focus in uh, uh, we will uh, uh, work in uh, areas where you know we think typically corporates are interested in. Basically, we are looking at uh, startups which you can which can become uh, a, you know strategic investment areas for corporates. 
So if we think there are certain corporates which are in, in, you know, interested in this uh, area, we would uh, encourage startups to be in that area so that uh, they can uh, get to a level and they can probably join hands with the corporate, either they can get acquired or they can get a strategic investment. Uh, next one is, do they have an accelerated product development cycle? When we need to really have this so that in a year, year and a half, we can get them out into the market and be, let them be ready for the next stage. And are they offering a very innovative alternative solution for whatever is there in the market today? Uh, is it solving a real on the ground problem? And is it solving in an innovative way so that uh, it can better, you know, it's, is it 10x better than the, you know, what is the competition that is there? Uh, typical cross disciplinary areas that we're looking at is uh, medical technology, finance, agriculture technology, or uh, ops management platforms. So it could be any one of those where we are having you know, cross-disciplinary uh, startups. What, what can professors and students do in these startups? I think one of the things uh, we should look at is, uh, you know, examples of uh, great universities like Stanford and Harvard. You would see that a lot of those uh, professors were there, uh, help start startups, and uh, you know some of them are you know why you know widely successful. I mean there are many many startup founders in uh, in Stanford, for example, who have become billionaires. And I think if you combine the net worth of uh, professors in Stanford uh, who have uh, you know got startups of their own, it should be you know probably in the range of about fifty billion dollars. So uh, you know I think it's a great example for us to go. And uh, I mean, there's a long distance to get there, but I think it's a great example to go, you know, for us to go there. Uh, if any of you as a professor, as a student, if you have the right idea, I think uh, it's a time to, uh, you know, uh, think about it, formulate what the problem is, formulate what the solution could be and uh, uh, take it to the next level. And, you know, and I think that is where Ramaya Evolute can help. And if your idea, if your idea is sound and if your idea has wings, we will definitely take it to. And we can have uh, uh, professors as co-founders. We can have students as co-founders. Uh, professors could also be consultants or guides or mentors. So there are multiple ways to engage and uh, you know take this forward. So it doesn't have to be uh, you know in one way. So I think each of you as a as a prof in the uh, professor or a student could look at this as a possible next step. And you know, you could do this work as, as in parallel with what you're doing. I mean, you could be a professor at the same time and mentoring a startup, for example, or you could be a founder in the startup and at the same time continuing your role as a professor. Uh, I have a picture here. I don't know if, uh, how many of you recognize this person. Uh, his uh, name is uh, Professor Ashok Jinjinwala. He's a prof in, uh, he's a professor emeritus, I think in IIT Madras now. Uh, he has been, uh, incubator of startups for the last 30 or 30, 40 years now. And he has done wonderfully well. And the kind of startups that he has started uh, has become really, really successful. Uh, he's been a you know, leading icon in that sense for us to, uh, as an example from India to, uh, you know, shows an example. I think uh, I would uh, request all of you to look at it seriously. And especially at this time when uh, as a, uh, medical ecosystem, uh, medical ecosystems normally, I think, evolve much, much more slowly than, uh, you know, pure technology, basically because it's mission critical and, you know, uh, people's lives are involved and all that stuff. And there are, I mean, obviously very, very heavy uh, statutory requirements and uh, processes to do anything on the medical side. But I think most of you, in one sense, are extremely lucky to have been there, uh, you know, during this time. I think in the last two years, most of your lives have changed. Uh, many doctors who never consulted remotely are consulting now remotely uh, because that is the only way you know you can do it. I mean, and there are people with needs and to help them, you need to consult remotely. There is no other way. So I think in that sense, this is a, uh, you know, uh, this is a point in time which is, you know, has, which will have a huge impact on how we work uh, and uh, in medical ecosystem is one, you know, one part of that. I think that ecosystem will also have this change. And I think this, I'm sure, will trigger a lot of innovative ideas in all of you. Uh, 
uh, and uh, once you have those ideas, uh, don't abandon them. If you can nurture them a bit, we can put them into make them a startup, and you know, put them into a startup, and we can take them to the next level. That's the uh, promise of uh, Ramaya Evolute. So uh, I think I will skip this. So this is a, a promise that we have. Uh, we believe extreme entrepreneurship is what is required to build a better India. Uh, we have the examples of uh, South Korea and Japan and uh, Taiwan and various other countries who have built fantastic economies by you know, focusing on extreme entre entrepreneurship. Indians are famous for their entrepreneurship zeal. Uh, we've probably been limited by our systems and processes still now. And I think this is a time that we have things which are open and we can take it uh, to the next level and sky is the limit. Thank you. I think that is a presentation from me. Uh, I can take questions if you have any. Thanks, Moody, for that uh, detailed uh, overview of Ramaya Evolute. Uh, uh, does uh, Samartha wants to add something? Since he's no, I don't think Samartha has joined. So, uh, okay. Yeah, so okay. he was not able to join. Yeah. Okay, sir. okay. So, probably we will take a couple of questions like from the participants. Sure. So if, the, sure. if anyone wants to ask a question, either they can uh, place it in the chat box or they can, they can just ask. So somebody has raised a hand. Veena Prabhakar. Yeah, Veena, ma'am. Yeah. You, can, you can unmute and you can ask the question. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Hello. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. It was a, it's a very nice uh, uh, introductory lecture about uh, Ramaya Evolute. Of course, uh, it has been introduced already and uh, further advanced lectures are very good. It will stimulate any young or old mind, I think, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, prospective uh, uh, developments also happening. My one question is, suppose there's a project, I mean, there is a, a techn technical project and it has already uh, been, uh, a proto has already been made, but uh, just uh, for an experimentation and uh, patent has not yet been filed. So can this be, um, applied for uh, Evolute? Absolutely, ma'am. I think uh, uh, we will take anything starting from an idea till, you know, uh, so if, if you're a, in, you know, a company which can stand on your own independently, which basically means that you could take a, get a VC investment. Uh, VC investments typically would be in the range of, uh, you know, a three to $5 million kind of investment. So if you have reached that range, then probably you are out of the Ramaya Evolute range. But from idea to that level, I think, uh, you know, and if you're cross-disciplinary, you're, you know, always welcome. I think uh, we, we can take. And uh, at times there are no proto models available to demonstrate, but still it's on a CAD model or whatever, and then uh, patents have been filed. So uh, absolutely, these yeah. projects can be, okay. Yes, 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 they can be, they can be. But this is not from the student side, this is from the faculty side. Sure, sure, ma'am. I don't think that is a problem. I, we are taking, I mean, we are not limiting this to students, faculty, or, you know, even uh, the Ramaya ecosystem. This is open to everybody, you know, in India. So, so but uh, are... we lost you in between, ma'am. Hello? Yeah. This yes, is, we can this hear, is you know. presented in a pitch day to the startups or something like that? Yes, I think uh, what uh, the process is basically that uh, there is an application process. And once the application comes in, uh, we meet the startup. Uh, we have uh, two uh, meetings with mentors. So uh, the first mentor will discuss with them. And uh, you know that mentor will be from a relevant uh, domain. And then the mm -hmm. second mentor would uh, uh, discuss with again. And so you will get two rankings. Mm -hmm. We take both these rankings and uh, put it to an industry committee to evaluate. After the industry committee evaluates, it goes to an investment committee for clearance on investment. This is the process. It's a fairly long, long process. We took uh, something like six to seven weeks to complete the process this time. So, uh, yeah. Okay, sure. I mean, I, uh, to understand, somebody has to jump into this. Only then uh, complete understanding happens. Only when we go through the entire process, one cycle. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, and uh, ma'am, I think the uh, point is that be, even before you uh, enter into the startup, uh, we are housed in the same facilities. You know, we could help you uh, 
uh, evaluate we could help you create a pitch deck we, we could uh, you know we could do all that on the site that's not a problem at all okay okay yeah yeah thank you thank you thank you ma'am for that in fact when uh, murli is mentioning it took a long time 6 to 8 weeks is very short because yeah, i was about to tell that it's very short because we have heard of uh, 5 to 6 years and beyond so this is real short <laughs> no we could be part of uh, sir yeah. i'm part of this karnataka state government similar uh, effort where uh, uh, it, it it it's uh, at least a 6 to 8 months process from the time of first uh, application to ah, even yeah. uh, the startups presenting to the expert panel so in that okay. sense it is an accelerated response and we should congratulate you and the whole team for it so it's it's, it's quite good in that sense yeah thank you thank you very much because actually our overall time is just two years you know we are a super accelerated fund so we need to <laughs> finish very quickly so uh, yeah but it was a very very busy 6 to 8 weeks for us <laughs> so at in in this junction i would like i like to ask you sir like in terms of like many of the doctors or uh, from the healthcare profession uh, we usually have ideas but translating and uh, uh, converting it into even a when what we call as a concept a business concept is a challenge uh, veena prabhakar has been one of the outliers i would say who has been in the domain of uh, this product development and innovations but for most of the other doctors the clinical focus is so much there that for them to i mean like move from that cap to another cap is very difficult so are there any attempts from the ramaya evolute of course we will partner and support in uh, bridging that uh, thought to action and the prototype to product uh, journey is there any training or capacity building uh, plan yeah i think uh, uh, what we are planning to do is number one regular interaction sessions i mean so so we could say we could set up a regular interaction session with uh, the hospital and uh, say that anybody who's interested in uh, you know coming out with a uh, you know, with an idea so you have an idea you want to take it you think this idea is a good enough idea to take it to the next level we could come and discuss we could uh, you know spend some time with you we could give you our comments and uh, we could give you uh, you know actions in terms of what should be the next few uh, few steps that you should take so that you can con- concrete as idea and you know take it forward so that level of hand holding i think uh, definitely we can do on a regular basis i think you know what i will do that i will work with you and you know we can put this into action yes we will we'll do that uh, any other questions no 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 specific questions uh, so thanks a lot sir thanks thanks for that uh, thing and uh, certainly as you told uh, it would be a continuous engagement where we will uh, work together and uh, yeah. hopefully like uh, we'll be uh, sort of like at least going in the path of stanford and uh, harvard so that absolutely. like we'll have some products to speak absolutely of. absolutely thank you very much thank, thank you for the opportunity yeah yeah and uh, as a part of the program we uh, had received a voice uh, message from uh, maruti from uh, nellore medical college nellore medical college who has been an entrepreneur and an innovator unfortunately the rar file which he has shared is not opening with any of the this thing over here probably the file is corrupted so what we will do is we will host the entire presentation and the video of the meeting on on the website and along with that we will have mr marthi's presentation as well as if possible we will try to have one more interaction because this is not a one time kind of thing we will have multiple interactions uh, wherein uh, the faculty and students can uh, come in and uh, explore their uh, innovative streaks and also sort of like move ahead in this path of entrepreneurship so uh, i take this opportunity to thank the institution the management for creating such a conducive environment because i remember like 10 years back or 12 years back if somebody had an idea even to sort of like uh, get to understand what to do of it it would take a long time so with uh, the division of research and patents in 2012 when we started uh, the, the whole idea was to create this kind of a seamless uh, ecosystem for uh, taking up uh, innovative projects which can uh, lead to some productification of those ideas and uh, uh, we, we we are in a very fruitful phase where the, within ramaya we have these entities who can support the complete cycle of development and beyond so it's 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 a very nice uh, support from the management and i thank the 
uh, principal and dean for uh, the support in organizing today's event, the impact lecture as a part of the Innovation Council's requirement for uh, innovations in uh, higher education institutions. And as uh, uh, Soumya who has been the coordinator of the program, uh, we have had uh, a very uh, meaningful interactions with the entire top management and uh, several faculty members as well. And we look forward to continuing the engagement and uh, take things further. Thanks a lot for the participants who have joined and uh, hopefully you have a fruitful day ahead. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all of you for joining. It was wonderful uh, interacting with you know, these uh, front runners in entrepreneurship and innovation. Uh, we hope that some of you are going to be the future front runners as well. I thank Dr. Nandukumar sir as well, who's been supportive all the while. And of course, um, our uh, principal and dean, uh, Dr. Medha Rao and Dr. Shalini Nehan, and uh, uh, Dr. Pratap sir and Dr. Suman sir as well. And nothing would be possible without the able assistance of our uh, PDP, Mr. Ravi. And Vaishnavi. And Vaishnavi. Thank you so much. Thanks all of you for joining us. Thank you. Yeah.